right, for today's lesson, we're going to be talking about tangents with circles. Uh, we've heard the word tangent before in Unit 7 when we were talking about trigonometry. This tangent is different. Uh, I'm not sure why they couldn't pick a different word to represent uh, this particular feature of a circle. Uh, but for a circle, the definition of a tangent is a line or segment that touches a circle once. Emphasis on that word once. So if you envision a uh, tangent, which is what's being illustrated in this diagram, it's a line or a segment that just skims right over the top of a circle. So it's only going to hit the circle in one point, and that point is called the point of tangency. Where Tangent touches a circle. Okay, so this point right here, that's the point of tangency. So if you hear me refer to that, that's the point I'm talking about. It's where the tangent skims right over and touches the circle in that one point. We have two different theorems that we're going to be working with with the tangent here. Uh, the first one says a line is tangent to a circle if and only if that line is perpendicular to the radius at the point of tangency. And this is a biconditional, so it means it works both directions. So you could say, first we know it's a tangent, therefore it's perpendicular to the radius, or it's perpendicular to the radius, therefore it's a tangent. So it works both ways. You can use um, this theorem to help you solve because you know there's a right angle. Once you know it's a tangent already, you can then say there's a right angle, therefore I can solve uh, using uh, Pythagorean theorem or trig or something like that. Or you could go the other way around where you, you may not know it's a tangent to begin with, but once you see that the radius is perpendicular to that line, then you can conclude that it was a tangent. So there are two different ways you can use this. And so if you were to draw an illustration here, that's how you would draw that. You have the tangent right here, you have the radius right here. The point where they meet is the point of tangency and they create that right angle there. Now, sometimes when they are working with this theorem, they also use the diameter. But remember that the radius is part of the diameter. So you could really say radius or diameter for this theorem because the radius is part of the diameter. So in this picture, you may just see half, or you may see the full diameter, but it's perpendicular for either of those situations. And then our second, that, sorry, second theorem says that two tangent segments to a circle from a common exterior point are congruent. And I like to call this the clown hat rule. All right, so this is saying if you have two tangent segments, so there are two segments that are touching the circle just once, right? So if you were to continue this on, right, it would still only touch the circle once, but they didn't draw the other end, so they just drew up until the point of tangency. If you have two different tangents coming from the same point outside the circle, that's the exterior idea. If they're coming from the same exterior point to touch the circle just once, each of those little segments are equal. And so if you think about a party hat, those annoying ones with the, the elastic band, um, they create that kind of triangle or cone shape, but in two dimensions, it creates a triangle. In order to have that hat look normal, both sides have to be equal. And so if you kind of imagine this as a face, right, you have the, he's wearing a hat, and so both of those little segments need to be congruent. So you have your perpendicular relationship between the radius slash diameter and the tangent, and then you have, you have two tangents that are coming down, but they're sharing that meeting point outside the circle. They're going to be congruent. So we're going to be working with those two ideas to help us solve in a couple different scenarios. Oh, sorry. I'm going to do a little bit more vocab first, and then we'll get to the solving bit. Um, so there are two new vocabulary words we're not using too much today, but I want to introduce them now because we will be using them in future lessons. So we have the idea of inscribed versus circumscribed. Scribed means like to draw or write. So the, the little, little bits before the scribed is telling you how it's been written or drawn. So inscribed means that whatever is being drawn is inside of something else. 
So in this triangle, sorry, in this picture, we have a triangle and a circle. The one that's being inscribed is the one that's inside of the other shape. So the triangle is inscribed in this illustration. Okay, whichever one's inside is the one that's being inscribed. But in this one, when you guys are thinking about circumscribed, which sure you guys have heard of circumnavigate before in your history classes or whatever, um, circumnavigate means to navigate around something. And so circumscribed means to draw something around something else. So in this picture, the one that's on the outside, the one that's been drawn around the other shape, is going to be the circumscribed one. So in this uh, shape, the triangle is circumscribed. <clears throat> Okay, so on this one, the triangle was inside. On this one, the triangle was outside. And so that's how you can tell the difference between those. So make sure you're looking out for those vocabulary words when we start um, looking into future lessons. We're also going to see this little activity. This is now gonna tie all of the vocabulary that we've talked about thus far, so from day one and today. We're gonna look at this picture. I have some, uh, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> The different objects here that are in the picture, we're gonna figure out what are they? What would I refer to them as? So the first one is D, that's this point right here. So that is a point, so you could call it a point, but specific to this diagram, it's more than just a point. We would call that a point of tangency. Specific to this diagram, because D is where this line touches the circle because that line only touches the circle once it's a tangent therefore that makes D the point of tangency where it's touching the circle line FH so FH is right here all right we could just call it a line but it's more than that in the context of this picture this line happens to touch each of these circles in only one spot here it touches that circle at H and here it touches the circle at F if that line only scans right over the top of the circle and only hits it once we refer to that as a tangent. Okay, so FH is a tangent. C, point C. Point C is located right here in the middle of a circle. We have a special name for that point. It's called the center. We talked about that on day one. Segment AD, that is from here to here. That's from one side of the circle through the center to the opposite side of the circle. That's a diameter that we talked about on day one. CD, segment CD is from the center to uh, the edge of the circle, that is a radius, also from day one. Line DE, so that's this one. Again, this line, it's not just any plain old line. In the context of this picture, it skims right over the, these two circles, crossing them at one point each, so that makes it a tangent, specific to this uh, situation here. And then angle ACH, which is right here. Yes, that is an angle, but it's not just any old angle. It has a special name in this context. The fact that it's inside of a circle and the vertex is at the center makes it a central angle. So you guys need to make sure you're using your academic language, understanding what each of these objects are uh, specific to these contexts, especially with circles. So you know when I refer to something as a central angle or a tangent, you know where to find it, what it looks like, and how to use it. Okay? Right, now we can get into this all. So these situations where we're going to start using those two theorems that we have uh, at the top of the page. So I'm trying to find the value of the variables, which is an x in all these situations, or well, there's a y here. And then it says, assume lines that appear to be tangent are tangent. You will have to make sure you look for that in the directions, because you can't just assume that something is a tangent, because if it's drawn kind of sloppy, you don't know if it's actually hitting the circle just once, maybe it's twice, you can't really tell. So, but this one allows you to assume that something that looks like a tangent is. So what's interesting is that I have these two tangents, right? Remember when we had that, that hat, right? We had the two tangents come out. We know that these two are equal, right? But the clown hat rule with that congruency is only really gonna help us when we're looking for side length. We're not looking for side length. So those two theorems, theorem one and theorem two, one deals with angles, the other one works with segment lengths. These are all, these first three are looking for angles. So I'm not gonna be using theorem two, the clown hat rule, because that's for segment length. I'm gonna be using theorem one. Theorem one, says that the tangent and the radius, or diameter, where they meet is a 90 degree angle, they're perpendicular. So I have a radius right here making this 90, I have another radius here making this 90. So I just found one of my variables, x in the corner over here, is going to be 90. All 
All right, so you can do them physically right now if you want to. So now the only thing I'm after is the central angle Y. I don't know what the arc is. If I knew what the arc measure was, I could find the central angle, but that's not the context or the information they've given us. Instead, I'm going to use the other three angles to help me find this fourth one. Notice that when you have the two tangents and then the two radii kind of together in this diagram, they created a four-sided figure, a quadrilateral, which we were talking about in unit eight. Hopefully you guys remember that all the angles in a quadrilateral add up to 360. Uh, if you don't remember, it's the sum of interior angles in any polygon is that formula 180 times n minus 2. Uh, the n is 4, so there are four sides, that's 180 times 2, 360. So just a quick reminder, uh, hope, make sure you memorize that, right? A triangle is 180, a four-sided figure quadrilateral is 360. Uh, so all of these angles should add up to 360, so if you just really quickly write that out, I have the 70, I have two 90s, which I'm just going to combine to 180, and then I have this other angle I don't know. So when you do some algebra and work through that, you'll see that y is equal to 110. Okay? Which interestingly, when you put the 110 here and then look at the 70, you'll notice that those two are supplementary. And that's not a coincidence. That will always be true in this scenario. Just think about it. If you know that the tangent and the radius of this corner right here is always going to be 90 because of 0 and 1, and this corner is also always going to be 90, that automatically makes those two 180 every single time. So you have two 90s added together is 180. Well, if all four of the angles have to add up to 360, and you already know that two of them together will always be 180, that means that the other two also have to add to 180 every time. So you can either do this full process every time if you want to. You can have the two 90s, 180, and then write out this full equation. Or you can use this little shortcut, which I don't have. It's not an official theorem. It's just, well, it will be a theorem that we'll talk about next time. This is kind of just an introduction to this idea. But when you guys have this scenario here, because both of these are 90, right, all four of these added to 360, or you can just remember that these two will add up to 180. Whichever process you want to do, that's a shortcut. The fact that these two add up to 180 and those two add up to 180, making them all 360. So you can just do this for supplementary. So if you do some algebra, I don't remember what that is, like 115. All right, it's a quick and easy way of doing that. But again, if you want to do the full method here, you can say 360 is equal to 65 plus 180 plus x, which is kind of like we did here, and then you can solve for it that way. But again, it will always be true that the opposite angles here will be supplementary, the same way that those two are, because the 290s add to 180. So we can do that here as well. These two will be supplementary. We have two 90 degrees here. So x will be equal to 102. All right, so that's using theorem number one, the fact that we have 90 degree angles at the corners here where the radius and the tangent meet. I can use that to help me find other angles inside of the four-sided figure that's created between all four of those segments. Now, this one is different because this one is asking for, or it's working with uh, lengths of sides instead of angles. So this is where theorem two is going to come in, the quantum hat rule. When you have two tangents coming out like this, it is true that these are perpendicular, but we're not working with angles here, so that's not really going to help us. What we do know is that for that hat to work, if you're wearing a hat and you don't want it to look funny, you need both sides of it to be congruent, and that's what's going to be true here as well. So I'm going to have x plus 20 is equal to 2x plus 4. Those two uh, tangent segments are always going to be equal. And so just do some algebra, and you get x is equal to 16. Okay. All right, we're going to do a little bit more work with theorem 2 now. Again, it's none of these are working with angles. We are going to be working specifically with the clown hat rule because we're talking about segment lengths here. So remember the clown hat rule says that if you have two tangents that are coming together to create like a little hat shape or a little triangle, it's not a full triangle because it's missing the third side, but that kind of uh, angle outside of a circle, those segments that create that shape are going to be equal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually do some color coding. You guys don't have to, but I want to make sure I illustrate uh, what's going on here. So I'm going to, for each hat, each hat, each little meetup of the tangent segments that are equal, I'm going to use a different color. So I know that from this point of tangency out, 
like this, that's one hat for the circle. So both of those are going to be equal. Um, we have another one here coming from this point out and then this point out. We have another one, make sure colored. We have this one right here. They can be kind of tiny. They can be a little hard to see because they're so so wide or short. The segments can be pretty short. Um, so that's why I like to color code them so I can see them better. And I have that one. Okay? So see, when I have a four-sided figure here, each of the, the sides of the quadrilateral have been broken up into pieces. So I have four little hats here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work through the numbers that I have in the picture and fill out the information because I don't know all of the pieces here. I'm trying to find the perimeter, which means I need to know what the full lengths are in order to add them together. So I know that this little segment here, this red, is 11. Well, according to theorem 2, the cloud hat rule, if this red piece is 11, the other red one has to be the same length. So I know that this segment, this red, is also 11. But they told me in this picture that the blue and red, this entire segment, this entire side of the quadrilateral, is two, uh, sorry, 20.5 total. So if I know that this segment is 11 and it's supposed to be 20.5 total, I can use subtraction. I can take the 11 away from the 20.5 to figure out what the other segment would be, which is 9.5. So the 9.5 and the 11 together makes that full 20.5, okay? And so I use the 11 to figure out the 9.5. Well, now that I know this blue segment, it has to be equal to this blue segment because the parts of the hat have to be equal. I know that this green is 8.6, which means the other green has to be 8.6, okay? Now to find the pink, again, I'm going to use that subtraction trick that I used before. I know that this segment is 8.6, and I know the whole thing, the green and the pink together, this entire section is 15. So if I want to find this little piece, I have to do 15 minus the 8.6 to find what's left over, which is 6.4. So again, the 8.6 and the 6.4 together make that full 15 that they were illustrating in the diagram. And then because this is uh, 6.4, the other half also, or the other segment of the tangent also has to be uh, 6.4. So you should see we have congruent segments all the way around. Each little segment here on the four different hats are equal. Once you have all those, all you have to do now is find the perimeter by adding all of them together. So you add all the little segments together. You can do that in your calculator. You should get 71. Okay, so that's using the clown hat rule to fill in the missing information that we didn't have to figure out what the full perimeter would be. We can do the same thing on the other one. This one has, is only a triangle. The triangle has been circumscribed around or outside the circle. So this one only has three hats. So we have that one, this one, and this one. Okay? So now we're going to find all the little segments, all the little pieces, and then we can add them together. So for the blue, I notice that this segment is 13, making this one 13. This segment is, I can barely read that, 10.3. This is 10.3, making this also 10.3. All right, so now I'm, I'm kind of stuck over here. I don't know this red, so therefore I can't find this red. So in order to find those two segments, I'm going to use the fact that the, this full length is 20.7, and this part of that full length is 10.3. So I can subtract this away from the 20.7 to get this part. So if I do that, that gives me 10.4. Again, you can see how they work together. Both of those combined is your 20.7. And then if this is 10.4, so is this. Each of those segments need to be equal. So once you find all that information, you can add them together and you get 67.4. Right, and then I have one more over there, again with the color coding. So I have one hat right here. I have another one right here, a really small one off in that corner. I have this one, and then I have this one. Again, we're going to do the same process. Uh, one of the numbers, the only uh, actual tangent segment that I know is this, the 10. When you have a full length with both of them combined, you can't really use that unless you know what one part is, so you can do that subtraction. So because I know this is 10, that means that the other pink has to be 10. Now I'm going to do some subtraction here. If I know that this full length, this 
both of those pieces together is 19.5 and this is 10. Your subtraction, I would get 9.5 here. Again, because if you add them together, they should equal 19.5. Now, if this green half of the hat is 9.9, .9, the other half is also 9.9. Because .9. remember, both of those segments have to be equal. All right, I, can, I can't continue in this direction because I don't know this, so I'm going to backtrack. If I know that this full side is 15.8 and this little segment is 10, that means this was 5.8 because both of those need to add together to get 15.8. That means that the other section that's red is also 5.8 because they have to be equal per the theorem 2, the quantum half rule. And then lastly, we can find these blue because this full segment right here is 15.5 total and I know part of it is 5.8. I'm going to use subtraction. I can get this is 9.7, which means this is 9.7. Okay. So you do have to use that subtraction idea a lot because they're not going to give you too many of the pieces uh, individually. You have to do a lot of that uh, subtraction in order to find the segments. But once you have all of those pairings of congruent parts uh, with the cloud hat rule, you add them together to get your perimeter, 70.8. And that's another way that you can use the cloud hat rule besides the previous example we saw, or the last example we saw on the previous page where you just write an equation to solve for x. This is another way you can use the clown hat rule to find segments in order to find perimeter or other things like that. All right, the last kind of question we're going to work with goes back to theorem number one. Theorem number one, just to remind you, uh, again, is that the, the way that a tangent and a radius or a diameter meet, they create a 90 degree angle. Now, previously when we were working with that theorem, we were solving for angle measures. You'll notice that in these, we're not looking for angle measures. Uh, we are looking for segments. But those segments are not um, conducive to the, the cloud net rule. They're not two different segments, right? They're not creating that hat that we see where we have two different tangents. Instead, they're creating a triangle kind of shape. And so we're going to be using theorem 1 still, but in a different way. We're not going to use it to find angles. We're going to use the fact that they're, nice, they're perpendicular to see if we have a right triangle. And then use stuff from unit 7. All right. So we're trying to find segment lengths. We're assuming that all, uh, the lines that appear to be tangent are tangents, indeed. Um, and then you can use decimals instead of simplified radicals in this example. Did I do that in my answer? Yes, I did. Okay. So uh, the thing I recommend doing is that when you guys notice you have a tangent and then a radius slash diameter. See how they drew the full diameter. But remember, even if it's a radius or a diameter, because a diameter is a radius times 2 you have that perpendicular relationship. So it's the first thing you want to notice is that you have a tangent and a radius or a diameter meeting, and that creates a 90 degree angle right here. Once you put that, put that in your picture, the next thing I want you to do is draw the triangle off the side. I want you to use a context that's familiar. We're not as familiar with seeing a triangle inside of a circle. So I want you to draw it separate. It'll bring back that kind of familiarity that we saw in unit seven, so it's not as foreign. And so I have this triangle here that I'm going to transfer the information over. So I have 7.5 here, I have the 12.5 here, and now this is where you have to be careful. When you're transferring the triangle out of the circle, you have to make sure that you put the information into the triangle correctly. This x is only talking about that segment, the radius. But this full thing, that we're, the full bottom leg of this triangle is the full diameter. So you have to be mindful of how you're adding the information into the picture. If I know that the radius is x, but I'm actually working with the full diameter, the diameter is 2 radii. Okay? So this is really 2x. Two 2x's two added together, 2x. Okay? That is one thing that's a little bit dangerous about redrawing the picture, but I still feel that the benefit outweighs that danger of drawing it separate. Okay? So once you're just really careful and make sure you have all the information, the full length of everything labeled correctly, this is a straightforward Pythagorean theorem. It's Pythagorean theorem every single time. You don't know any of the angles, so the only way you can solve for a side in a right triangle if you don't know any of the angles is to use Pythagorean theorem. So that's what you're going to use. 7.5 squared plus 2x squared equals 12.5 squared. Now I did put this in parentheses on purpose, so please make sure you do that. Uh, when you guys are going through the scratch work, this turns into this number. I'm going to pause on that for a second so I can get this down, and this would be 156.5. Now, the reason why this is in parentheses is because just like when we were, I'll draw this and then erase it, just like we were doing this in Unit 7, 
when there are two objects or parts to the thing that you're squaring, you have to square both of them. So we practiced that in Unit 7 where you distributed the square, and that would be really 3 squared, which is 9, and then the square root of 3 squared, which is 3, and then you multiply them together. Okay? We practiced that in Unit 7. We've seen that before. It's the same thing over here. Because this term that we're using to label the side has two things in it, we're going to have to distribute the square to both. So this is 2 squared, which is 4, and then x squared, like that. You have to be very mindful that you do that, otherwise your material will be incorrect. And so I'm going to subtract this number over, which coincidentally becomes a whole number, which is nice. And then I divide by 4, which is 25, and then I take a square root. That just means that x was 5 to be in. Okay? So this is, again, we were able to solve this problem using the fact that these two segments right here, the tangent and the diameter, were perpendicular. If we didn't know that, we wouldn't get anywhere. But that shows us it's a right triangle, and then we can use Pythagorean here. Okay? So all of these are just like that. They vary in difficulty, though, uh, with special details being included or not included based on information that they provided. So make sure that you see all of these and you're comfortable with them because each one of them is a little bit different than the other. All right, this next one, again, here's my diameter, here's my tangent, they are perpendicular, so I have that right angle, so I'm going to draw my triangle outside. The x is referring to this side. The 8 is only referring to this little segment right here, which is outside of the triangle, so I can't say that this full segment is 8. That would not be true. 8 is only referring to that segment right here. Okay, so how do I figure out what the full side is? Well... Look at over here, what we, they've given us. They said that the, the diameter is 30, and this little segment right here, it's not a diameter, but it is a radius. The second part, the, the other part of this side of the triangle that's being added onto the 8 is a radius, as well as this side right here. This side right here is also a radius. And hopefully you guys remember, a radius is half of the diameter. So if I want to know this segment, it's going to be half of the diameter, which is 30. So this is 15, and so is this. Okay, so they gave us the diameter, so we could in turn find the radius and add that information to the picture. So this full segment of the triangle is really 8 plus 15, which is 23, and then this part of the triangle, which goes from the point of tangency to the center to help us create that triangle, is 15. See how I did that? Make sure you use the information. They may not be upfront. May not be upfront about the information that you need order to label the triangle. So you have to add information just kind of like we did over here. So you have to be really careful how you're working with the question. So if they give you the diameter, double check to see if you're actually using the diameter for the triangle or you're just using the radius. So that's something to look for. But here we go, a simple application of Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus uh, b squared equals c squared. The hypotenuse is across from the right angle. Uh, we're going to solve that And then since you're allowed, the directions say you can write your answer as a decimal. You just take the square root of 304, 304, and that is 17.4. Okay? All right, next one over here. Again, here's my radius, and here is my tangent, though that's where the right angle is. You have to be very careful so you know which one's the tangent and which one's the radius. If you accidentally put the 90 degree angle here, first of all, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't look like 90 degree. Uh, a 90 degree angle should never be coming from the center. Right, it should be pretty obvious that's not happening here. But if you had done that, everything would be messed up for the Pythagorean theorem. So again, it's the tangent, which is the one that's outside the circle, just barely coming up to touch it just once, and then the radius. So there's my right triangle. Draw it off to the side. I have the 12 here. I have the 20 here. And then my x is only referring to this segment right here. So I can't just call the hypotenuse x, right? x is not all of this. X is only this little piece. So remember, in order to figure out what this is, I need to add this on. All right? Well, what is that? Well, how much is that? Well, this right here is from the center to the circle, which is another radius. Okay? And then I already know what the radius is from this little segment of the picture, which is 12. So that means this is 12. Okay. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different for this question. I'm going to put a y here, a new variable. 
Uh, the reason there is a way that you guys can solve by labeling this as x plus 12, but it involves foiling, which if you're not super comfortable with remembering stuff from algebra one, that would cause some issues. Uh, if you're not familiar with how to foil or you can't do it very well. So I'm gonna bypass that. I'm gonna use this shortcut to help you guys bypass the foil and potential factoring that you might have to do. Um, so this is a favor. Um, it, it is hard to remember to do, um, but it is a favor and it's gonna make the process a lot easier. So as a rule of thumb, uh, when you guys are working in this, this scenario and you're, any one of your sides, it's more often gonna be the hypotenuse than anything else, but if any one of your sides is a sum, where it's like a variable plus a number, use an alternative variable. We call it a stand-in. Use a stand-in variable and then write what that is equal to. So y is my stand-in variable and it represents 12 plus x. Because I want to avoid foiling and potentially factoring and just all the work and space is going to take up, I'm going to use y as a representative to stand for 12 plus x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve for y, which is the full length here, and if I just want x, if I know what the full length is and I subtract 12 away from that, that's how I can find x. It's going to be easier. If I can just find what the full length is and subtract 12 away, it's going to be easier than having to FOIL and factor potentially. Okay, so I have this labeled. My y represents the 12 plus x. That is really what my hypotenuse is. But I would use the Pythagorean theorem. Right, so 12 squared plus 20 squared is 544. And then I take the square root of that, so y is equal to 23.3. Now, this is where you have to pause, okay? Y is not my final answer. Remember, y was the bypass I was taking, the shortcut I was taking to avoid some of that complicated, messier work. Y is equal to 12 plus x. Remember, I'm after x. That's why I call this variable y, so I don't get confused, because if you call this x, when this is x, if you use the same variable to represent two different things, you're going to get super confused. So I pick a different variable, and if you just remind yourself of what you're after, I'm after x. I'm not after y, I'm after x. If you just keep reminding yourself, then you'll know not to stop here, okay? y is equal to 12 plus x. So I have, now that I know what y is, I can say 23.3 is equal to 12 point x. Sorry, plus x. Right, this was y, I just found it. So now I know that whatever x is, that's going to be whatever you need to add on to 12 to get this. So this is basic algebra. This you can just subtract 12. Subtract the 12 away, and that gives you x by itself, which is just 11.3. Okay? So again, if you want to write an extra little note above this problem, somewhere off to the side, you know, it took up a little bit of room there. Anytime one of your sides is a, a variable and a number added together, you want to use the stand-in variable here. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck foiling, because if you try to square, if I had written 12 plus x in square, right? I'm sure you guys have seen my signs over here. They're more, uh, you see them more in algebra two. But whenever you guys are squaring something that has a subtraction or an addition in it, you need to foil, not distribute. We're able to distribute for these ones, because that's not addition, that's multiplication. But if it was addition, you have to, and then factoring and all that. So. Just remember to do this process instead. All right, three more. I'll do a little bit more quickly just to get more practice here. All right, I have my tangent. I have my radius. See how I'm tracing them? I recommend you guys do that so you can identify which ones are which. So I have my tangent and my radius, 90 degrees. I'm going to redraw my triangle. Okay, this is the radius, or this portion of my triangle is 10.5. This segment is 14. And then here's another one where the x is outside. Okay, the x is outside of my circle, and I need this part to get the full length. Okay, and remember, my radius was 10.5. I have another radius here, which is also 10.5. All the radii in a circle are equal. <laughs> so I know this little segment is 10.5. So the full segment I want here is really x plus 10.5, right? But remember what we just saw in the previous example. If you would have to write x plus something, don't do that. Use a stand-in variable. If you have any sort of addition on any side of your triangle, it's going to get super complicated, so don't do that. I'm going to use y as a stand-in. y represents x plus 10.5. Once I find y, I can come back around and use that to find x. So now Pythagorean theorem, 14 squared plus 
10.5 squared equals y squared. 14 squared plus 10.5 squared is 306 point, oops, that's wrong, 306.25. And then when you take the square root of that, y is equal to 17.5. Okay? Now remember, it's not y we're after, we're after x, we're after x, not y. y was our stand in. And so y is equal to x plus 10.5. So now that I know y, I can say 17, which is my value for y, is equal to x plus 10.5. So you just use some basic algebra, subtract the 10.5 away, you get that x is 7. Okay, so again, anytime that you're labeling your triangle when you redraw it, if you have to write something plus something else, don't do that. Use a stand-in variable and then go back and solve using subtraction. All right, this one, I have my tangent and my radius, 90 degree angle. So I have my triangle that I did not draw very well. Let me draw that again right angle. Okay, I know the full top side here is 15. I know this is x. And then luckily they've given us this bracket or this little arrow to show that the entire length is 17. So I don't have to do any addition. If they had said this was 17 and this was x, I would have had to write x plus 17, which again, you have to use the standard variable to solve that. But they gave us this arrow to show that from this end to this end is 17. So don't chop it up. We actually don't know how it's been chopped up. Just know that the entire thing is 17, okay? So then this is a pretty easy one. It's just straightforward. Pythagorean theorem. X squared plus 225 is equal to, I don't know, I kind of skipped a step. Uh, I just found what those two are and subtracted them and you get 64. So whatever 17 squared is, you subtract the 225 and it leaves you with 64. And then when you take the square root of that, you just get eight. And our last one here, here is our diameter, here is our tangent, those are perpendicular because the diameter has a radius in it. And then I have my right triangle, this is five. Uh, okay, so this one you have to be very careful how you're looking at the picture. This six right here is only referring to the radius. I know how, because if you, if the six was referring to the whole thing, they'd have put a bracket or put the six more central to the segment. But they only put the 6 here, so that means that the radius value is 6. So if I want this full segment here, the full diameter, I have to multiply that times 2, which makes this 12. Okay, so just make sure you guys are looking for that kind of detail. Like we saw the d equals 30 or something up there, we had to divide by 2. This one is the reverse, where they only give you the radius, and you need to double it to get the diameter. Now, here's another one. Again, x is this segment, and then I have a 3. If I wanted to write the expression for this full segment, I would, it would have to be x plus 3. And remember, anytime you have to do something plus something else to label a side, don't do that. We're going to use a standard variable instead, y. y refers to the entire length of this side, which is the same thing as x plus 3. So x plus 3 is the label that I want on that side, but I'm going to represent it as a y, so it's easier to work with. Then I can go back. All right, so again, Pythagorean theorem, 5 squared plus 12 squared is equal to y squared. Uh, I'm just going to do that really quick. This is 169 when you find those numbers, which means that y is exactly 13. Okay. Remember, y is not what we're after. We're after x. When you loop back around, we know that the y is equal to x plus 3. If y is 13, oops, if y is 13, and I know that x plus 10 equals 13, that means by subtracting the 10, x is equal to Oops, I don't know why. Sorry, I was anticipating the answer. That's my bad. Sorry. Y is equal to x plus 3. If you subtract the 3, that means x is 10. We were the answer too early. All right. So again, look for those scenarios where you guys have the something plus something else as the label, and make sure you use a standard variable, and then go back around and do this extra little algebra to solve for x.